Mercury, the liquid metal, so unique. It's been revered and feared for millennia. It is, after all, the only metal that is liquid at room temperature. For this reason, from ancient alchemy to modern science, the story of Mercury is one of fascination, discovery, and danger. In this video, we'll dive into the complex history of this rather elusive element. Mercury's story, at least in human terms, begins 3,000 years ago. Keep in mind that if you're talking about the physical element of Mercury, it's far, far older. Ancient cultures were already aware of this strange liquid metal that just had this sort of amorphous shape in contrast to virtually any other type of metal at room temperature. The ancient Egyptians extracted mercury from cinnabar. Cinnabar, as you know, kind of sounds like cinnamon, and this is because it has a dark reddish brown color. It kind of looks like quartz, but it's actually not a type of quartz. But it does emerge in areas of volcanic activity. The ancient Egyptians had used this for numerous products, such as embalming mummies, cosmetics, and other practices mostly involved in burials. Which I suppose is fitting given the fact that mercury is really good at killing everything. Although I'm not quite sure it's particularly good for aesthetics and cosmetics, given the fact that people don't particularly look sexy when they're dead. And Mercury is really good at making sure that you're dead. Eventually, the Greeks got a hold of Mercury as well. The philosopher and protochemist Democritus discussed the substance and how it shifted between solid and liquid states, depending on the temperature. Again, we're not exactly sure if this was referring to Mercury, but it probably was given the fact that Mercury has the lowest melting point of any known metal. In fact, the Greek name for Mercury, Hydrogerium, which I'm certainly mispronouncing, literally translates into water silver. After all, it does kind of look like liquid melted silver. But it's not at extremely high temperatures. This is why today we sometimes call mercury quicksilver. In ancient China, they would also use mercury as a contraceptive along with lead. And it turned out that this was very effective because mercury is, again, very good at killing everyone around it. It was really good at making sure that you didn't have an unwanted child. And probably good at eliminating the mother as well. So thankfully, people watching this just use condoms. Don't use mercury. Anyway, the Romans would eventually also use mercury. They loved ripping off everything they could from the Greeks, and they used it again in cosmetics, not recommended, as well as mirrors in various forms of early manufacturing. However, again, its liquid form made it a little bit more difficult for it to be widespread compared to, say, copper, tin, and most of all, iron. You have almost certainly heard of the word alchemy. Alchemy is considered to be a proto-science, which means that it's not really a science, but it's not a pseudoscience either. It's really a sort of precursor to science before the scientific method. Alchemists during the Middle Ages would experiment with different substances, chemicals, and materials, oftentimes in search of an elixir that could be used for immortality, or perhaps something that could change anything they wanted into gold. This is known as the Philosopher's Stone. For the most part, this is proven to be BS. However, the study of mercury by alchemists did set up the stage for the modern science of chemistry. As stated before, I mentioned the Philosopher's Stone from Harry Potter, which is some sort of substance that can turn anything into gold. Due to its mysterious nature as a liquid metal, mercury would oftentimes be used as one of the favorite metals to convert to gold. And needless to say, this was not successful. Because of how bizarre and cool it looks, mercury was oftentimes considered to be associated with immortality or transformation. Transformation I understand given its liquid state. It has an amorphous shape that can change in sharp contrast to any other metal at room temperature or anything close to room temperature for that matter. But 
immortality is a little bit unfitting in my opinion, given the fact that it, again, is very, very good at affirming your mortality. Nonetheless, mercury was mixed with other metals and other elements to be used for more practical purposes. The more and more alchemists and later chemists experimented with mercury, the more they realized just how dangerous and toxic it was. For example, in the Renaissance during the late Middle Ages, in Italy and early modern ages in Italy, they started to use mercury for medicine. For example, it was used to treat syphilis in STD. And I suppose mercury would be very good at killing the bacteria that causes syphilis, but would also be very good at killing the person who had syphilis. In a period of time before modern medicine, but during the rise of our greater understanding of chemistry, mercury became a sort of panacea, a cure-all for various diseases. Now, in our modern day, panaceas are oftentimes considered to be a form of pseudoscience. If a type of medicine claims to cure everything, then it probably cures nothing and is total BS. But people at the time didn't know any better, and they oftentimes used mercury for a variety of purposes. One of the most common examples of mercury applications was, again, in the medical field for tooth fillings, a practice that has become far less common today, given the fact that, again, mercury is really good at killing people, and it's not a good idea to have every bite you take done with teeth that are coated in this death metal. This is not to say that mercury's skills at killing anything and everything aren't always useful. For example, mercury is very good at being used for disinfectants on wood preservatives in order to make sure that wood doesn't get moldy due to fungi or various other forms of decomposers. Obviously, you wouldn't want humans or pets to come into contact with these substances, though, but it did ensure that certain microorganisms decomposing whatever substance you were working with did not decompose it. Mercury was also used for deworming medicine for livestock, and it was used as a laxative. Granted, if you are constipated, please don't consume mercury. You may have heard of the Mad Hatter's disease. This occurred during the 1800s during Victorian England, as it was rapidly industrializing. Many of the workers had mercury poisoning, which caused mood swings and confusion. However, the scientific validity of some of these claims is still up for debate, given the questionable ethics of medical practices during the Victorian era by modern-day standards. The one use mercury is oftentimes used in today are for thermometers. They are very good, or mercury I should say, is very good at tracking temperature. With that being said, even this is kind of dangerous. Here's an anecdote. My mom told me a story of how she broke a thermometer as a child, and the other kids were playing with the liquid metal. Again, there are far better toys to play with. For this reason, much of the mercury in thermometers has been replaced with iodine, which is also pretty good at noticing temperature variance. During the early 20th century, you saw the rise of the conservationist movement, and by the mid-20th century, the environmentalist movement. By this time, there was an abundance of evidence showing just how toxic mercury is, and given the fact that it was used in a widespread manner in the industrial sector and mining, there was a great deal of concern over mercury contamination, both for the wildlife and the public. After all, these thermometers were everywhere. Thankfully today, Mercury's applications are far more limited now that we have very rigid regulations. And they are subject to some of the strictest policies, quite possibly only rivaled by lead and uranium. In 2013, the Minimata Convention on Mercury was signed by a variety of nations to reduce mercury emissions in order to protect human health and the environment. Today, mercury is by and large used for in a far more limited fashion, sometimes for industrial light bulbs or for some limited purposes in the medical fields and namely the dental fields. But again, it's not used for tooth filling, usually high-end equipment that doesn't come in direct contact with people. And there are abundance of precautions. One thing we need to keep in mind is that there are risks that we may be unaware of. And perhaps there are substances that we use today that are also toxic to us, but we haven't learned enough about them. This doesn't mean we should disregard anything just because of the worst case scenario, 
but it does mean that we should proceed with caution nonetheless. And it's honestly kind of a shame, because let's keep it real. For all the pain and suffering that Mercury has caused, it's liquid metal. And that's badass. <laughs>